Hey, sorry, it cut out. And then I uploaded it to YouTube. But that took a minute. So, um, Santiago, we left off. Oh, yeah, okay. So, what are they doing? The old man asked, pointing at the people in the plaza. Working, the boy answered dryly, trying to make it look as if he wanted to concentrate on his reading. Actually, he was thinking about shearing a sheep in front of the merchant's daughter so that she could see that he was someone who was capable of doing difficult things. He had already imagined the scene many times. Every time the girl became fascinated when he explained the sheep had to be sheared from back to front. He also tried to remember some good stories to relate as he sheared the sheep. Most of them he had read in books, but he would tell them as if they were from his own personal experience. No. She would never know the difference because she didn't know how to read. Meanwhile, the old man persisted in his attempt to strike up a conversation. He said that he was tired and thirsty and asked if he might have a sip of the boy's wine. The boy offered his bottle, hoping that the old man would leave him alone. But the old man wanted to talk, and he asked the boy what book he was reading. The boy was tempted to be rude and move to another bench, but his father taught him to be respectful of the elderly. So he held out the book to the man for two reasons. First, that he himself wasn't sure how to pronounce the title. And the second, that if the old man didn't know how to read, he'd probably feel ashamed and decide on his own accord to change benches. Hmm. Said the old man, looking at all sides of the book as if it were some strange object. This is an important book, but it's really irritating. The boy was shocked. The old man knew how to read, he'd already read the book, and if the boy, if, and if the book was irritating, as the old man said, the boy still had time to change it for another. It's a book that says the same thing almost all other books in the world say, continued the old man. It describes people's inability to choose their own destinies, and ends up saying that everyone believes the world's greatest lie. What's the world's greatest lie? The boy asked, completely surprised. It's this. At a certain point in our lives, we lose control of what's happening to us, and our lives become controlled by fate. That's the world's greatest lie. That's never happened to me, the boy said. They wanted me to be a priest, but I decided to become a shepherd. Much better, said the old man, because you really like to travel. He knew what I was thinking, the boy said to himself. The old man, meanwhile, was leafing through the book without seeming to want to return it at all. The boys noticed that the man's clothing was strange. He looked like an Arab, which was not unusual in those parts. Africa was only a few hours from the Tarifa. One had only to cross the narrow straits by boat. Arabs often appeared in the city, shopping and chanting their strange prayers at several times a day. Where are you from? the boy asked. From many places. No one can be from many places, the boy said. I'm a shepherd, and I've been to many places, but I come from only one place. From a city near an ancient castle. That's where I was born. Well then, we could say that I was born in Salem. The boy didn't know where Salem was, but he didn't want to ask, fearing that he would appear ignorant. He looked at the people in the plaza for a while. They were coming and going. All of them seemed to be busy. So what's Salem like, he asked, trying to get some sort of clue. It's like it's always been. No clue yet, but he knew that Salem wasn't in Andalusia, and if it were, he would have already heard of it. What do you do in Salem, he insisted. What do I do in Salem, the old man laughed. Well, I'm the king of Salem. People say strange things, the boy thought. Sometimes it's better to be with sheep who don't say anything. And still better to be alone with one's books. They tell their incredible stories at the time when you want to hear them. But when you're talking to people, they say some things that are so strange you don't know how to continue how to continue the conversation. Haha. <laughs> Okay, so, 
<laughs> My name is Mel Sheezitnik. We'll look that up. Said the old man. How many sheep do you have? Enough, said the boy. He could see that the old man wanted to know more about his life. Well, then we've got a problem. I can't help if you feel you've got enough sheep. The boy was getting irritated. He wasn't asking for help. It was the old man who had asked for a drink of his wine and had started the conversation. Give me my book, the boy said. I have to go gather my sheep and get going. Give me one-tenth of your sheep, said the old man, and I'll tell you how to find the hidden treasure. The boy remembered his dream, and suddenly everything was clear to him. The old woman hadn't charged him anything, but the old man, maybe he was her husband, he was going to find a way to get much more money in exchange for information about something that didn't even exist. The old man was probably a gypsy too. But before the boy could say anything, the old man leaned over, picked up a stick, and began to write in the sand of the closet. Something bright reflected from his chest with such intensity that the boy was momentarily blinded. With a movement that was too quick for someone his age, the man covered whatever it was with his cape. When his vision returned to normal, the boy was able to read what the old man had written in the sand. There in the sand of the plaza of that small city, the boy read the names of his father, his mother, and the name of the seminary he had attended. He read the name of the merchant's daughter, which he hadn't even known. And he read things he had never told anyone. Do you want to finish or keep going? I'm going to finish this one and then we'll do another one. Okay? So that was the ending of the other one. I love you. Good night. Or good morning. Or good day.